hello world, hello beautiful women out there, I hope you're doing amazing. It is a fabulous month of March and of course one that I hold near and dear to myself. It is the international month for us as women. This time around, the Nalo Leader Show is here to celebrate that phenomenal woman, myself, yourself, and all the sisters that we have out here in the world. Now, particularly in this show, we'll be talking about women and the law. That is a subject that is very near and dear to me. Now, to talk about that particular topic is a phenomenal woman, one that truly inspires me and inspires so many out there. Ladies and gentlemen, she has been in the legislative community and of course that is the parliament she has held positions such as a leader of opposition woman mp for Kasesa district and of course a fierce leader very very um you know vocal uh, when it comes to issues around democracy as well as social justice now that is just a bit of her profile ladies and gentlemen welcome with this uh, beautiful uh, experience is a woman that i am so happy welcome well, welcome <laughs> can you tell i am definitely blushing at this point ladies and gentlemen help me in welcoming the one and only Mel's Winnie Kiza. oh my god If there was a song I would particularly ask that the DJ plays, Strong Woman, <laughs> Phenomenal <laughs> Woman, uh, you are most welcome. The one and only Honorable, I still and in a very endearing way call you Honorable uh, Winnie Kiza, you're most welcome. Thank you, Tracy. And happy Women's Month to all the women out there. Happy Women's Day to all of us, the sisters of the world. I join the rest of the world to celebrate and commemorate the month that was put aside for the women, the month of March. Congratulations, sisters. Doesn't come that easy and hasn't been an easy journey for us, the women of the world, to reach this far. Mm -hmm. So, congratulations. The congratulations. whole team at Nalo. Yes, thank you very much. That was amazing. Yeah. We are very, very excited to be hosting uh, you on our show. And yes. this is the first profile that we are doing. And, wow. you know, to sort of branch into, and this for us was a very intentional approach to how we want to celebrate um, women. We always do visual explainers of different laws okay. to have a sit down particularly of a phenomenal woman such as yourself, is the first of its kind, and you're most welcome. Thank now, you. Now, I did introduce you, yeah. but I don't think I did justice, so I'm going to just jump right into it. Um, if someone were to ask you yes. to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about yourself, what would you say? I would say I'm Winnie Kiza, former member of parliament for Kasese district, former leader of the opposition, by the way, former district councillor for Kasese district in the sub-counties of Kisinga and Kyondo, a mother of many, including a set of twins. So I'm a married woman and happily married, by the way. A woman that has come from far, maybe to many, I, I will say, I, ca I represent those who have gone through hard times and the good times. Because <laughs> my background is a so humble one, very humble, that when I speak about it sometimes, I also don't understand myself, but I know that God is so powerful to the extent that when he chooses to lift, he can lift you from grass to grass. So I celebrate all the women out there who have broken barriers to get to where they are. I know many women out there are not spoken about and yet they are doing amazing jobs, amazing work. They are breaking barriers in their own ways and in their own communities and nobody is there to speak about them. But we are here to really highlight the enormous work being done by so many women out there. It is the math where we showcase what we have been doing. It's a math where we celebrate ourselves. Yeah. We celebrate each other. And so I come here specifically to join the world 
to celebrate the women, to celebrate the achievements that have been made by many, young and old. Our girls, we celebrate you because we know that in you, we see the future. In us, in them, we yes. are the future, actually. Yes. Uh, and so, and also someone said, the future is female. The future, <laughs> yes, is, the future is, is, is female. Yes. Yes, <laughs> and I, I see it coming. <laughs> <laughs> yes, interesting. Um, you mentioned so many hats. Yes. You are a mother. And not only yes. that. Um, you are a politician, you are mother to many, mm -hmm. yes? And yes. you continue to mother. Yes. <laughs> so many. So um, many. Including myself. Now, for those who actually don't know, I do also come from Kasase, a particular <laughs> place uh, that is called Rukoki. See? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? <laughs> No, people would think possibly we are doing the show uh, the Kasese oh, way. Yes, the Kasese but way to be <laughs> exact, <laughs> yeah, I um, had no idea. Me, my I my know. mind told me you come from the neighborhood of, of, of Fort Porto yes. or possibly yes. the entire Toro region. Yes. I didn't know that you're one Since of... It's a small world. I'm one of us. <laughs> okay. And of course, I said, you know, I will not say that prior. I'll say that on set. So, I mean, you just got it. <laughs> okay, fine then. I, yes, interesting. It's um, well. For it me, is. what matters most yes. is that you are a woman. Yes. Wow. wow. And so I celebrate all women. Yes. Now, including you from Kasese, because now you represent my yes. voters. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just um, get into it. So many hats that you do wear. Yeah. But um, so many of us don't know where you got that inspiration from. But not mm. even the inspiration. You growing up. Mm. Tell us a bit about yourself growing up. Because yeah. this fierce woman we see today did start somewhere. Now, for me growing up, I think I went through so many stages in growth. First, I was brought up by a woman. My father, who was a teacher, died when I was in P2. So we were at home with our mother. She had seven kids to take care of after the passing of her husband. And so we saw this woman struggling to raise our school fees, to ensure we eat, and of course, keep the home. But most importantly, this woman defied culture. Among us, the because of a man when he passes on, the woman is supposed to be inherited. We are talking about the law. Yes. That is the native law. <laughs> the native law of the land. The native law of the land yes. Yes. that widow inheritance is a traditional issue that we had to deal with. Well, we were kids, we didn't have any idea about that, only that we saw that our mother was being tough with her in-laws and was saying, for me, I'm not going to be inherited, but I will keep in this home. And I'm not marrying, I'm not going anywhere, I'm taking care of my children. And this earned her trouble. Because the family said, how can you be so stubborn like this, that you'll not be inherited? She said, yes, there will be a, a, a man figure whom my children will be looking on maybe for advice, yes. but I am not going to be his wife. I married one man and he has died. So they looked at her as a stubborn woman. They didn't want to associate with her. Some of her in-laws could not want to associate with her. And because of that, she had to suffer alone in the whole family because she had become a rebellious woman. So somehow at that tender age, I got to realize that there are some cultural stereotypes yes. that we have to deal with. Yes. I grew up knowing that there are injustices that happen around the world. Because I kept asking myself, how many women are going through the same because of their resolve to challenge certain cultural norms? and traditions. So I grew up with that. And then as I was growing up, one of my uncles took me up as daddy's friend. He became the foster father. 
But just like in my family, because as I was growing up, my mother and my father were active politicians. My mother was a, a member of the Uganda People's Congress, while my father was a member of the Democratic Party. Politicians. Politicians of different political parties, but living together happily as husband and wife. So I knew that someone can have a choice. And that, it, that choice need to be respected. So this helped me to grow up knowing that people's rights need not to be suffocated. Because my mother, given the setting that was at that time, possibly would have been forced by the husband to belong to the political party of the husband, as the case was in many homes. Many women would say I belong to this political party because that is where my husband belongs. So it kind of would be like a family party. <laughs> But my mother comfortably and freely belonged to her own political party while my, my father belonged to another political party. And at never at any one time had I ever seen them quarrel Over. because of their differences in the political affiliation. They would talk openly about the mistakes in one party and the other mistakes in one party. And at dialogue. some point, yes, they would dialogue. I saw dialogue tolerance at its best growing up as a child. So when I went to stay with my uncle, may his soul rest in peace as well. He died recently due to COVID. He was equally practicing politician. And that's where I came face to face with the realities of politics, betrayals. So love, I saw support because I would see people we thought were close friends to uncles betraying him. They come to sit with him in his meetings. Then they go to the opponent's camp and they are here. And I said, this animal called politics. Mm -hmm. But I thought something should change. So I kept, up, I kept uh, thinking I need to participate in the leadership of this country. Be where decisions are made so that I can be in a position to put a building block at least to advocate for the marginalized. Be a voice to those who cannot speak. Because I saw what my mother was going through, and nobody was there to speak for her. She was being condemned for things that really did not mean so much to her, because this was her choice. And I thought she had a right to say, no, I'm not taking on any other man. And I said, no, I think these things must be challenged. So somehow, that's how I grow up knowing that certain things need to be questioned and that you can actually question and you don't die <laughs> because I saw her questioning culture and she did not die. So I said, okay, it gave me at least some a foundation, a foundation to follow and yes. I, that is how I came up to be into the leadership. But then by and large through school, I took on roles of leadership. And for me, it didn't matter whatever role that was available. I would take it up because I knew that it was an opportunity for me to serve. Every role that came by, I would take it up because I knew it gave me an opportunity to serve. At least I will be where decisions are made. And I talk about things that I feel are not being spoken by others. So that is how I came to be into the political arena, coming from school, the politics of school. <laughs> then I jump into the mainstream politics uh, in 1998 in a decentralization program as it was being inaugurated. So I contest as a district councillor for two sub counties in Kasese, Kissing, and Chondo. And that is when now I realized the biases that people have about women and specifically different categories of women. I was, uh, I, I contested in that race as a young girl. And of course I was contesting with women, <laughs> mature women. According to them, the space was supposed to be for old women. Because me, a young girl, fresh from college, what do you, what do you know? Experience. You are not married. How do you talk about issues of women? 
these are barriers that I started breaking at that early stage of uh, joining politics, of with your husband who has brought you into politics. That's how I realized that even in politics, they are kingmakers. You have to be attached to a big man in the neighborhood, or at least those who are known to be the kingmakers, to be accepted by society. Yeah, yeah. Even Yes, and fellow women will ask in whose camp are you? Whom are you associating with? Who is bankrolling you? Said, oh, but now me, I am coming to represent the issues of women. So it became an issue, and I realized that even when we, we have the laws, for example, the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda says anybody above the age of 18 is free to participate in elections meaning that you can vote and be voted for. But here I come at the age of 27, and people are questioning my, my capacity. You, you young girl, there is a space for the youth. Why don't you go to the youth seat? But I mean, I am in my right as a woman, to supposed to contest in this space. So I saw that they are small things that we may look at as very small issues but they make them central during elections mm -hmm. and during times of enabling women to take part in leadership. There are so many things for which they will hold women accountable, and yet they are not holding men okay. accountable for the same, because the male counterparts, the ones who are contesting for the same position, no one as counselors, there was one who was not married and was actually my age mate. But nobody ever asked him who his wife was. <laughs> nobody ever asked him about his age. For me, it became an issue. You are not married. You are young. You can't understand our issues. But the other young man, they were not telling him he will not understand the issues. Who is bankrolling him? Who has brought him into the race? So I realized even when we have the laws, people don't understand them, and they still look at women leadership as something that is far-fetched. Mm. And it hurt me a lot during that time. But I said, here I am, I have come, and I am ready. Well, what people have not known, that first time I contested, I lost the election by 126 votes. Mm -hmm. Well, as fate would have it, then the person who went through as the counselor could not uh, remain in the castle because she was a teacher. So she abandoned and resigned from council. So there was a by-election, I think, three months after. After the election? Yes, after the main election, then there was a by-election. I came back again. I said these voices are not going to deter me. Now this time I was even more resolved than before. So whenever they would bring the issue of you are not married, I said, now, you know the culture of the Bakonzo. Now I was using the culture against them. Our culture does not allow us to look for men. It is men who are supposed to look for women. Even when I love you, boys, I can't just come to them and tell them I love you. Because tradition does not allow me. Now here I come. I'm looking for your vote to begin with. Second, let follow it up and marry a counselor. <laughs> 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 because me, That's I see, scary. yes, I'll tell them, I see your boys, I admire them. If I was to be given the opportunity outside the culture, I would have told them that I love them. <laughs> but they have not told me, I don't know whether I'm ugly or what. So I actually put it over there to them, to the boys, and said, here I am. I put myself up, I am, I am now doing twice. something against the culture. To say a woman has gone on a platform to say I'm looking for a man to marry. This is against culture, but you are making me do it because you haven't come. So the boys now it was their duty to defend themselves <laughs> why they have not they come. come. And I started seeing them saying, no, 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 no. Vote for her, I'm going to marry her. Vote for her, I'm going to marry her. So eventually I was accepted and I was voted. And that's how I became the district councillor. When I reached council, then I was privileged to be given the Secretariat of Finance and Administration. So I became the Secretary for Finance and Administration, kind of the Minister of Finance and Administration, my, my fi <laughs> Finance and Administration at the district. Yes. And I was very powerful because we did budgets that would work. 
not like the current district councils. For us, we would say we are going to build here a road and we would build it. We are building a school and we would build it. And it was out of what we did while I was in the council that propelled me to contest for the woman parliamentarian seat. And so that has been the journey. After that one, I have never looked back. I am going forward. I think the remaining seat is the presidency. And who says that will not happen? The future is the she. The future is female. Um, <laughs> very interesting, very interesting. I think, um, you know, it talks about mental models. At such yeah. a very young age, your mom mm. did so. Yes. Um, and it's no coincidence that mm. you are as fierce as mm -hmm. you are today. Your dad equally um, yes. really laid a firm and, and actually, my uncle used to tell me, I'm taking care of a leader, not just taking care of an ordinary citizen. Yes. So work hard and be there. Work hard. He would inspire me. He's one of the few men who believed in the ability of women to lead. Wow. One of the few men who believed in the ability of women to lead. Because he would even give me roles in the family that would put me ahead of others. Yeah, ahead of others. I would imagine now this is a huge role for me. Yes. And I would keep telling myself, this is supposed to be done by a man. Yes. But let me do it and show him that even women can. Now, for me, I would do it wanting to prove a point. I now I did. <laughs> yes, I, I I I would do it to prove a point to him that I think he was just trying to test me. Let me show him that even women can, and I would do it to prove a point. I didn't know that along the way he was mentoring me. So I really want to thank him for the mentorship he built on from where my mom uh, stopped. But of course, when I was going to contest as a counsel, I went back again to the hands of this strong woman. We did the campaign together, and she had mobilization skills that I have never seen. Even in her old age, she was mobilizing. Women are truly agents oh. of change, and that has always been the case. It's just yes. some people are late to the game. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about the fact that, you know, not just your dad um, mm -hmm. playing a role, but equally the laws um, that were in place. I mean, you said... You know, it was okay for as long as you were 18 yes. to vote or be voted for. Yes. Um, and so I wanted to talk about the fact that the laws, you know, people could argue the laws are in place. Yes. Um, the affirmative action policies are in place. Um, we have women like Winnie Kiza who mm -hmm. eventually become not just, you know, um, finance uh, executives, and, uh, yeah. uh, but you go on to be, you know, woman MP for mm. a district, you go on to be leader of opposition in parliament. And so someone could easily argue that we have the laws in place, we have the policies mm. in place. Mm. Um, in your opinion, aren't we there yet? I mean, are we there? Aren't we there yet? Yeah, to some extent we are getting there, but there is a lot that we have to do to fully be there. One, the laws are in place, but who is implementing these laws? The laws are implementing by men who are not yet ready to let go of power. To the extent that even when they are implementing the laws, they still want to really see that the women are given second class kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. What do I want to mean? That you will even reach these big offices where we have executive directors as women, when they go into meetings with men, and possibly it is break tea, some men will not shy away from telling the CEO, please, madam, get me some cup of coffee. Because they believe it's a duty of a woman to serve men. I always struggle with journalists who ask me, at your level, do you also cook? As if cooking is written on the faces of women that they must cook. When you go to, to restaurants and hotels, whom do you find there as chefs? Men cooking. So the cooking they do in hotels, what stops them from doing it in their homes? So the stereotypes and the, uh, the, the, the cultural barriers that we have faced for years, structured, still hold the women back. 
they are men who can't allow their women to go into the public domain. And they will refer to culture, they will refer to tradition, and it will be okay. Even when we have the laws, who will allow you to take a land title of the marital land to bank without approval of the husband? Or even a family meeting to sit to say the woman should take it. Even your own land as a woman, they can't allow you to use it as collateral without getting the permission of your husband. While the law is there to tell me that I have freedom to, to own land, and yes, the title is in my names, but society and culture requires that if I'm to use this title for anything else, I have to first consult my husband. If my husband is dead, I have to consult my son. But I mean it's in my names. So the mindset of the people also needs to be dealt with as we talk about the laws. We still have people who think that women who are up there, they are big-headed, they are stubborn, they don't respect. Because they expect that even in your big office as vice president of the Republic of Uganda, you are expected to see visitors coming to your office of the vice president and you kneel and greet them because you are a woman. And they are not expecting the president to do the same. So we, we still have a long way to go. One, even educating parents to give as much respect and give fair treatment or equal treatment to boys just as they're giving to girls. It is still a long way to go. We talk about numbers. Talk about the affirmative action, which we are proud of, and I'm a product of the affirmative action. Because if there was no affirmative action, possibly I wouldn't have been MP, because I, studied, I started as a councillor under the affirmative action. I came as a member of parliament under the affirmative action. But I have time and again asked and challenged the affirmative action law. When you are talking about affirmative action, it means there is some injustice that you want to cure. We are looked at as a weaker sex. Actually, they call us marginalized. The women we fall under the marginalized. So the marginalized must be treated with some fairness. And they say they are correcting historical injustices and imbalances. Yes, we agree. They are historical imbalances and injustices which must be corrected. But tell me, how do you say you are, creating, you are correcting a historical imbalance and injustice by saying a one woman should contest in a whole district <laughs> while men, you are just chopping a few sub-counties? Yes. If I may just give an example of Kasese district. It's a district with five constituencies with over 43 sub-counties and town councils. But the male MPs of the five constituencies, there is one who has three sub-counties, the one of Kasese municipality. You know there is a Nyamwamba division, central division, and uh, uh, the other division. Now, only three. But the woman MP, has over 43 sub-counties. They are paid the same amount. There is no difference in pay because all of them are looked at as MPs from Kasese district. Transport, transport mileage is the same. Salary is the same. Now remember, this is a woman of 43 sub-counties but is paid the same amount with a gentleman of three constituencies. With a, one of only three sub-counties. Is that fair? And would you look at this woman and you, look, you consider her to be weaker? You are doing her a favor? You are correcting her historical injustice? It is affirmative action among the two who is on affirmative. So the, these, even when we are talking about affirmative action, I think we need to redefine what this affirmative action means. We know that campaigns go with money. So a person you look at as being weak you are subjecting her to a wider area, meaning she has to cough more 
than the one whom you think is uh, directly elected, as if others are not directly elected. Directly elected, that's what they call them. <laughs> directly elected MPs, affirmative action. So it, it becomes a problem. And because the mindset of the people is not yet worked on, women still fear to go into the places where men are operating. Issue being that many people will tell you, they will give you names for contesting with men. They don't understand that it is equally your right. So yes, there is the law, but I think the law has also weakened women more. How is that so? Yes, it is weakening them more, subjecting them to that conditional territory. Tokenism. Now it is bringing in the tokenism kind of. The politics that we see currently of uh, handouts, it means the woman is going to give out more handouts than the male counterpart. And then she's subjected to a lot of work. But remember, this woman, society believes that she has to also play her role as a wife. I've told you I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a grandmother, I am an in-law, <laughs> and therefore I have other roles that society thinks these are for the woman. If there is any sick person in the home, the woman is called upon to go, no matter the title. No matter your... No matter session. your, your sessions in the parliament. Deal with the, the home first. Yes. And then when you say, no, 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 there is a parliamentary session, the woman is becoming big-headed. She no longer considers her roles. And where, are you married to parliament? Those are the things they will ask a woman who is in parliament. And no wonder many of the women, by the way, have had challenges in their marriages because of failure to balance work and uh, family, family life. Let me life. just uh, jump in right there. The laws um, have their shortcomings. Um, you were in parliament, and I want to particularly speak about the laws um, that are meant, like the likes of affirmative action, that, you know, uh, policies that are meant to sort of put women at the forefront. Do you think the women in parliament, particularly, or the legislative assembly, is working in unison to have laws, stringent laws, to not just not just to protect women? But, yes, to protect women. Yeah, I think there are laws that we have put in place. There are laws that we have put, not necessarily for, well, some are for the protection of women, because we do believe that women still face a lot of challenges, challenges that may not enable them to progress in career, progress in decision making. And so some of the laws to protect them are still there and we have to do them. The, 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 the laws relating to the female genital mutilation, that is a law that we had to put in place, the domestic relations, we had to put in place because some of the violences that are meted against women don't give them chance to rise and shine. The matrimonial property. share of the matrimonial property, our relationships in homes with the spouses, some of these laws become detrimental to their growth. And so it is true that we need to put laws that still protect women and children. Because when we don't protect the children, then the girl child equally suffers. And these laws, we, we, we have uh, put them in, in parliament and they are there to, to, to add on what we already have. Now, what else we have advocated for is possibly the 50-50 representation. What Rwanda did that you will say this is a district, we shall have one woman and one man. To some of us who are questioning the cost of administration around parliament, we say that even that law can help us reduce parliament. Mm -hmm. Because if we have 146 districts, and we say this, each district should bring one man and one woman, then automatically we come to around almost close to 300 members as compared to the one to the 557. So we would be cutting parliament almost by a half. Yet answering the, yet the other question of how do we ensure that we strike a balance. Now two, 
We have also, and this was a proposal that was uh, done by civil society, political parties, and uh, religious leaders in 2012 under the Citizens Compact on Free and Fair Elections. We thought that there is still a lot that needs to be done to put women to where we want them to be. Because we still believe that celebrating just this one day of International Women's Day and everything ends there is not enough. Yes, we use this day to showcase what we have done, the achievements we have made, and possibly the challenges that we are still exposed to. But as long as we have not worked on the mindset of those who come to do the laws, because even in parliament it is majorly men. That is why the law on marriage and divorce has not passed, because the men there question certain clauses in the law. And when you look at the clauses that they are questioning are actually the clauses that empower women. And they are saying we are giving too much power to the women. While the religious leaders were questioning even the title that how do you have a law talking about marriage and divorce? Kind of you are saying that when you marry, you must divorce. We said it is not like that. But even when there is no law, marriages are happening and divorces are happening. So we need to prepare for both. That is why even God gave us the Ten Commandments saying, please worship no God but me. Knowing that there will be some people who will worship other gods. So he had to caution us. Mm -hmm. Not that he was telling us there is another God whom we must worship. But, case, but just in case you find yourself in worship. such a situation worshiping, please just know that I'm a jealous God who tolerates no rival. Yes. Yes. So we are telling the religious leaders that the Lord does not actually say that we are sanctioning marriages to divorce. Mm -hmm. so these are issues that we are still dealing with, yes. that in many areas, some parents still feel uncomfortable taking their girl children to school, that they have not, we have not worked hard as a people also mm -hmm. to highlight the few role models that we have to enable our young girls down there and possibly the other parents to understand mm -hmm. the need to put their girls mm -hmm. in the same, in the position, same, in the same position as the boys. And, and I think that's a very important one because I also wanted to talk about the laws are there and more are still being formulated. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you think the women themselves understand the law? Do you think it's part of the reasons why perhaps we are not yet there when it comes to that particular. Many of the women don't understand the law. Majority of them find themselves in seats because they are supposed to be occupied by women. But as to why they are into those spaces, some of them don't have to understand. Problem being that even those who are in those positions to begin with, they have not grown up into structures that have enabled them to look at themselves as women, or they have not been mentored to believe that women are equally capable. Some of them have male figures who have pushed them to contest with an agenda, with an agenda and so they are just being controlled on remote. He who pays the paper calls the tune. So some of the women are put into politics by some men somewhere, those I talked about as kingmakers. So it is this kingmaker who will keep this woman on remote control. The woman will never discuss issues that are close to her heart because someone else is controlling her life. She can't even stand on the, on the floor of the house or in the district council to talk about things that are happening in her community because the one who paid is not on the agenda of the one who paid the, for the election. But she has to keep constantly pleasing this person. Then I, I, I also know that the constitution has not been translated in many languages as, it, as required by law. And so many people just know we have a seat for women as to why the, the, seat, the, is the seat is there, it is none of their business. So for that, we also call upon the members of the civil society because they have a platform to just continue talking to people, continue engaging the communities to let them understand 
why women should be in leadership. The few, for me, as I was growing up, I was looking at people like Winnie Vyanyuma, the Miriam Matembes, the late Cecilia Ogwal. I would hear of the Winnie Mandela. And I would say, I just want to be like those women. I saw the Alice Alasso struggling as I was now growing yes. to learn politics. I saw these great women participating and holding the candle for other women. And so for us, when we came into the space we had women who were looking on to yes. farm women farm women yes. and you would say i just want to be like those women yes. these women are not going down again to act as role models for the young women to emulate they are not going down to act as exemplary women for the many men out there who still bar their wives from participating in leadership so while the laws are there, and we really thank the, the, the makers of the laws, we still have a lot of work to do around sisterization, dissemination, and mindset, trans mindset transformation. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. true. Um, and you know, I was going to go to that very question and ask, you know, what more needs to be done? You mm -hmm. know, what more needs to be done to make sure Whereas the laws are being met, even the ones that make them truly understand their impact and why they're being made. But equally, how do we bridge the gap, especially between the women and the law, to sort of make sure that we are all driving towards um, the realistic goals that we want? You know, mentorship does not stop. Yeah. Every Personal, I use every opportunity to learn. If I get any space that is talking about something, I join it because I know by the end of the day, I'll have learned something. So my, my desire has always been to see that more of the trainings for the women who come into politics happen. More trainings of, for young girls in the school setting need to happen so that girls grow up knowing that they are valuable, they are useful, they are needed in community and that anything without them is not for them. You know, people will say we are discussing for women, we are putting a budget for women and it's not the women who are discussing a budget for women. So who will discuss for you if you, the women, are not there? So more trainings need to be given to the women. We know that uh, even in home settings, we don't give our girl children the same opportunities to interact with people like we give to boys. We are so protective of our girls that we don't help them to build their self-esteem. While we let the boys go, go and play with your friends, but we are cagey on allowing the girls to go and play. What are we doing to them? We are just narrowing their chances of creating networks. And yet, in politics, networks are very, very important. Go to the golf course and see how many women you will see there playing golf. Yet, this is a very serious network that would give money to anybody going to politics, or that would give support. Go to these uh, organizations that have serious networks, maybe Lions or... Uh, the Lions Club, the, the yeah, okay. Rotary Club, yes. yeah. all those clubs. Until recently when we discovered Zoom, many of the women would not attend those meetings of Rotary Club for fear of arriving home late because majority of the meetings happen in the evenings. Now, this is where you can get ideas of how the nation can be run. These are the platforms and where you can get networks that can support your idea Ambition. of contesting, your ambitions. That's where you get to know what people are doing in terms of business. That's where you get to get ideas of what you need to, be, to do to stand out from the crowd. But many women are not there. Unless if you are a husband and wife and you have gone as a couple, then you can be there as husband and wife but not many of our young people are into these groupings because we don't allow them to get out. Two, we don't, uh, they don't have the luxury of time because of the too much work they have at home. 
While we shall allow the boys to go, they can come around eight. The girl, you need them home at six. But these groupings are not yet sitting. They are sitting at seven. So somehow the mentality around women and girls in upbringing is not the same that we put around boys. So the laws, yes, are there, but are we using the laws for that good of women? Or even the laws themselves are conscripted in a nature that they will not support the growth, career growth of women. That is the thing. To the extent that even those of you who are not in politics, you are a CEO, then people will begin asking, whom did she sleep with to get to the top? So for a woman to rise, the assumption is that there is someone who has held her to get there. She can't do it on her own. She can't do it on her own. That is the assumption. Now, while for a man, they think out of her, the man is a genius. He has, he, you have even read promoting <laughs> him. He has yes. gone to those levels. Yes. That is what I hate about our society. That while a woman is equally gifted and can raise to ranks like a man, for a woman, there will be questions. I remember when I was uh, appointed lead of opposition. The questions were, how at this time would you bring a woman for a lead of opposition? We are in challenging times. This is not a time for women. This is not a time for balancing gender. Mm -hmm. Actually, no woman can handle the situation. Enough. Yes, not even strong enough and of all women, huh? <laughs> so I was like, so you mean which, kind? which type of woman is needed to handle such an office? They think that women can't handle tough times as if there is any tough time like giving birth. Has any man ever handled that? Has any man handled that? <laughs> <laughs> so, all these stereotypes, even when we have the laws, but the mindset is still backward. Including the mindset of women, they are still women who think it's only men that can do great things and amazing things. Very few women believe in the capacity and the capability of their fellow women. So we need to also change the narrative amongst ourselves to enable women to start believing in themselves that they can. And so, as women, we also have a duty to do some deliberate efforts of lifting each other, holding each other's hands, and give, patting each other on the back to let them understand that they can do it and that they have the capability to raise to where they want to go. And like we said at the beginning, the future is she. The future is she. Um, I, I know <laughs> when you're having such nuggets of knowledge, it is so sad to have to end it. I feel like we could always go on and on, especially if you're listening in to mother of nations at this point. <laughs> <laughs> she is a phenomenal woman and we've had the honor of hosting the amazing, honorable as always, Winnie Kiza on this particular episode of the Nello Legal Show. Now, I hope you continue to stay empowered and by the way, make sure you really get it. Too, especially as a woman because in this space that you are in we will need as many women to advocate to you know front our gender and sort of push us uh, to where we need to be we are not there yet yeah but we certainly we will i mean it's a unified front yeah efforts that will get us there i hope you have had an amazing time with us today until next time Bye-bye. Bye-bye.